Uh, yeah, we can take a question, Chuck. Can, I, can you stand up and try and project so people can Oh, hear sure, you? yeah, yeah, I can do that. Um, you told me about this uh, coming together to discuss Bronx quite some time ago, and I wasn't really thinking about coming necessarily, except to see you again. Uh, but then I read a blog yesterday uh, that I don't usually do, and it was so horrific and so terrible that I, I, I want to pose a question to you all, a la Martin Heidegger. Um, yeah. You know, what are the downsides to this? This, this blog uh, from uh, Professor Paul Harwick, I guess, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Professor at NYU, uh, I'm looking at it now, the opinionator, um, it's from the New York Times. And it's all about Ludwig Wittgenstein, who I happen to have studied for six, seven years and know a lot about, and think that um, it would be helpful for other people to know about him. And this particular professor wrote the most um, uh, banal, uh, almost misdirected, uh, clearly um, uh, not informed article about Ludwig Wittgenstein. Nothing wrong, nothing sort of that missed the point necessarily, but you know, what the fiction style was all about the misuse of language, if there's a couple of <laughs> sentences to talk about that. This guy doesn't even mention that, right? And talks about, you know, how Wittgenstein thought that philosophy was useless and couldn't answer the questions it wanted to. I mean, stuff that, you know, if, if you all were reading it, I would think you'd probably read it and say, oh, you know, not very interesting. And yet this man, Elizabeth Wittgenstein, is probably one of the most amazing philosophical geniuses that we've had in the last who, who knows how long. So my question is, have we given a platform to people who have who claim to have some right to talk on subjects, put it out there in the world, um, and, and you know sort of uh, <laughs> democratize this, but there's no check, there are no balances, and even the responses that came, the blog responses, clearly were people who didn't know anything about looking at the Ludwig Wittgenstein either. So my, my question again is, is there some way to m mitigate against the fact that there's so much crap out there right, in blog land, as well as good stuff? How, how do we even begin? I mean, should we have a journal that critiques blogs? I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> okay, but, <I> <laughs> that's good. Uh, well, I, you know, I think, I think if you have a computer and you're connected to the internet, you sort of take it for granted that there's just a wealth of misinformation out there. I mean, every time you look on Wikipedia, you think, maybe, you know, sounds good, I don't know. <laughs> so so I, I think that, I don't know, I could be wrong, but I, I think that, how do I know what most people think? But I think most people I know think that you have to be careful or, you know, take for the green salt what you're reading on, on the internet, and that would hold true for, I mean, I'm curious, I wonder how many Blogs have fact checkers from Florida. Does it matter? Well, what we do, actually, some of my students were with me today when we were going through, and they got this heartrending lecture from one of the guys who who works on the editing side of the blog about you know fact checking and and how we ask the, the people who are writing the, some of the posts to to list the facts and the sources underneath. Um, but it's you know. It, it's, it's not so much that the facts are sometimes, you know, the decimal place is in the wrong place or something like that. It happens. And, on the one hand, the internet is much easier to correct. But it's, it's the lack of mind. It's the lack of analysis. It's the, frankly, I blame Gutenberg for the whole thing. It, it became much entirely too easy to publish. And things have been going downhill ever since. Well, that comes out of the barn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a, I keep thinking there must be a way. Uh, actually, you know what I'd love to do? Somewhere there must be these incredibly wonderful laments about how printing has destroyed the relationship. <laughs> There's laments the, about how the alphabet destroyed memory and thinking back in uh, back in Plato and, and the Greeks. Yeah, so uh, somebody should do an anthology of mourning. Uh, of, these, of these dead technologies, but anyway, you know what you what you end up with, I think, on the internet is a different kind of filtering, which is 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 this kind of, you know, somebody who people find dull or uninteresting or unreliable gets gets linked to less, and people talk about them less. But also, you as you go through, 
you know, you look up something on Google or you follow a link or something like that. Say, this is really interesting. This is really good. And you go back to it. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things, that, that article, which I saw, I hadn't read, you know, is New York Times. I mean, it's opinionator. It's, it's uh, it, you know, this is typically someone who's well thought of. I don't know the professor per se. But, um, and, you know, journals have always published bad stuff. It's, it's not new. Um, if there's something that I think is specific to blogging, and it's not purely specific because you have it in journals too, it's the way that blogs can create what we call echo chambers. Um, the same, you know, yes, you could read The Nation and you could, or you could read the, the, the National Review and be conservative or, or, or liberal, um, but it's very easy to live your life caught up uh, now amongst 50 or 60 different blogs that all have the same point of view. And if you find groups of people who say things and you link to them and you read that, you can become more and more convinced that that's, uh, that's reality. Um, that's, uh, and that's the worry I have more about blogs. I mean, you're always going to have bad articles. Uh, and articles you disagree with, other people might like it. I haven't read that particular article. But um, the, the, the echo chamber um, on the internet is, is, is pretty astounding. And it's r rare that people read blogs of different political persuasions. Um, but that's just something to think about. Um, I have a quick, I want to ask. Francine, in, in one of your recent blogs, in your new books, you talked about the series of Enlightenment. And, and Walter was just talking about Peter Berger, the 80-year-old or 80-plus-year-old guy who knows everything and is writing what he wants to write about. And one of the things that is amazing about what Peter does and what you did in this piece is you're writing about Enlightened and then suddenly Chekhov comes up, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think in many ways, blogging is a perfect medium for people who have a huge iceberg of knowledge and sort of, you know, are able to look at things in the world, I saw, I saw this show, I saw this movie, and write something, tying it into a lot of these things. And I'm wondering if you think that's almost, you know, is there, is there an age range is it, for being a lot? <laughs> I mean, is it, no, is it, no. Shocked yeah, yeah, no, but, I'm, I'm, but that's, the, you know, is that an important part of Bobby to have this sort of iceberg knowledge that you can write over a number of years, or is that not important in, in looking at the way you see what you're doing? Oh, it's funny you should say that because I, part of the pleasure of writing these blogs is, is my feeling of like, finally I have something to do with it. You know, I mean, for, I, mean I, wrote that, I wrote that blog about um, the shootings in the, uh, in the theater in Aurora, Colorado. Mm -hmm. and, and it just so happened that I've been looking at all these um, murals of hell in, in Florence, in Italy. So, you know, so, so I was, and I've been thinking about the devil and, and evil and so forth, and, and being able to put them together was just, again, I wouldn't want to spend 4,000 words doing it, but it was, but it was great. And, and I mean, you know, I find an excuse to bring Chekhov in wherever I can. Yes. So that might not be the best example, but, 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 but even so, I mean, there's something about that show. And, and the way that, that happened was I wrote to, to Hugh and I said, you know, I've been watching this HBO series that no one is watching, it's about to die. And I think it's really, really great. And it's much better than all these series have been getting attention. I mean, it's, it is very painful, but it's really good. And he said, well, what a funny coincidence. People in the, o in the office have just been talking about it and just been writing about it. But, uh, but you know, you, you look at that, that series, and Chekhov does come to mind because the, 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 the ambivalence and the compassion and the annoyingness of the characters are, is, are, is very Chekhovian. I'm wondering what Walter, I mean, about, I mean, you know, the, 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 the number of the things you mentioned, the Federalist Papers, the Tatler, Johnson, I mean, these are people who took to this after having done other things. And I'm wondering how, how you think, how important that is. Is, is blogging a, a second or third act, kind of? You know, well, I, I think there are different kinds of blogging. Um, mm -hmm. But I think this is, um, you know, I'm, I'm teaching a writing class this semester, and the students are here. And it, it's, it's something you realize that young people starting out as writers are, are concerned, you know, by a number of questions, like how do I use language to make it do what I want it to do, but also uh, how do I get heard, how do I get listened to, also how do I know when I have something to say? Uh, 
you know, what's my point of view? And it's certainly true that uh, when you're young, your political opinions may change. It's sort of like, just like you may not end up spending your life with the person you're seeing right now, you may not end up following the political philosophy that you're dating right now for the next 30 or 40 years. And with the internet, tragically, everything that you write can be Googled forever. <laughs> so there's a certain kind of, um, you know, shyness I find uh, in, and I think you have to you have to start at, as with anything. I mean, any kind of writing, you have to think about what do I have to say that other people might be interested in. And so there there are topics on which young people are experts. Yes. You know, uh, in a sense, generations go through different you know different processes and they're, they're, they're kind of the same in all generations but you know you know what's happening to sort of say some relations between men and women or men and men or women and whatever's going on you understand that intuitively in a way that people from other generations who would be interested to know how this ancient human reality is working itself out in the specific context of the frame of the world you got something to say Certainly there are a lot of economic policies that are going on in terms of the way, you know, in so many workplaces now, older workers are getting the old good retirement plans and the younger workers are getting these new not very nice ones. Um, you know, there are all kinds of things that are going on that, that you know, younger voices have something to say. But it is, and it can also be a kind of an intense fire. You know, they're, they're young people, they're books that only a young writer can write. Pure, it's often very pure, very energetic, a very focused vision that is untroubled by some of these sort of complexities and shades and shadows that come like, and that, you know, the literature of Achilles, you know, the young hero that is just moving straight along the path. And then there's the literature of Nestor, you know, <laughs> sort of old, grumpy old guy who's seen it all a million times, and let me tell you, you know, but, so you, you, figuring out where you stand, and then what is there in your stance that gives you something to say to other people, and then what's the right form in which you can express it, I think there's blogging for young people, and there's blogging for all kinds of other people, too. Uh, yeah, Peter. I would just stand up, please. And, yeah, I would just ask, um, having said that, um, you're talking about authors that have an audience to lots, and the danger is there, given that to uh, what you're saying. Because I think you suggested that. By an audience driven blog, you mean? You know, you know, yeah, let's kill the blacks. You know, Give it to me, Professor Solomon. I don't think I'll have a huge you know, audience. Yeah, that's kind of thing. Um, well, you know, you do, I mean, you certainly, one of the things that blogging does in a way that, that, that really does change as a writer, my relationship with a lot of things is, I can see in real time what people read and what they don't read. I can look and see on Google Analytics or all these other places, you know, how many readers actually came to a particular post and how long did they stay with it, which is, it's the kind of thing no writer ever really wants it to know. <laughs> but once the knowledge is there, and so then the question is, you know, how do you sort of, you, you have the things that you're interested in and think are important, and you have the things that your readers are interested in and think are important. How do you get them to, to talk about it? We were going over that one of the posts we were analyzing today from the students with somebody writing about events in Georgia and the shift in Georgian foreign policy and new shift to Russia. The editors of the blog are going, we just don't think very many Americans are going to read a long, complicated post about Georgian foreign policy. And we can tell from our statistics that they're not. So how do you, you know, there, there, are, two, there are a couple of ways you can go as a blog. You can say, well, fine, we're just not going to cover that stuff because, you know, they don't read it. Or you do what's harder, but I think is more worthwhile. Though you sometimes get do funny things. Is think about well, how could we get people to read? And one of the things that came out was 
Well, this guy lives in this like amazing house that people call the Bat Cave. Uh, the new president of Georgia is this very showy thing, and people kind of like, oh, the president lives in a Bat Cave, and he made his money like being very close to Putin. Well, that's kind of interesting too. But then it's also Georgia's close to Sochi, and there's going to be terrorism at the Olympics, and one reason Russia is trying to fix the relationship now. So what turned, what started as a story about, you know, foreign policy maneuverings among some countries you're not quite sure where they are, can turn into a story about bat caves and Olympics and terrorists. You know, and all of those things are there, but you you have to find them, and then you link them so that you know, at the end of the day. Writing is sometimes like being, you know, you know, being a parent. You've got this little kid, and you're going like, "Have another spoonful for Grandma." Uh, and blogging makes that harder to miss, but you still have to try. I think. But, but don't you think there's a danger in in looking at how many hits you get? Uh, no, not in looking, but in letting that influence what you do. Well, it it I wouldn't stop writing about something that I thought was important because they weren't reading it. But I would think, I'm not writing about this right, because my goal is to have people, you know, I've got, if, if I weren't trying to share something about this, I wouldn't be about to think it was important. Obviously, I have not succeeded in communicating my sense, I think what's going on in northern Nigeria is important, damn it, you know, and, and so it, it spurs you on. But I think a lot of I think a lot of newspapers and a lot of places do just just look and they say you know what our foreign coverage doesn't get as much attention as our domestic coverage so more Justin Bieber and left less European <laughs> monetary union you know I mean and that's sort of what blogs lead to is there's going to be a blog on Georgian foreign policy that the people interested in it will read. Right. And it will be ghettoized to extend there, and the rest of us won't get it. But then it, then it becomes a service. You can be the blog that reads a lot of these specialized things and can figure out what in these little specialized communities actually is of interest to a wider community. And, and that's a service. But, but, I mean, let's say even the New York Review blog, you know, you can look at the number of comments. I mean, if that's, I mean, that may be, I don't know how to do the thing where you can look at the number of hits, but I do know how to look at the number of comments. And, and it seems to me that if you mention God, or if you mention guns, or if you mention, you know, whatever, you, you're sure of getting a lot of comments, but if you mention poetry, I'll write it. You'll get fewer comments, but, but, but that's, I don't, it seems to me it's always been a danger to let that, right. let that, you know, Mr. Melville, you're not getting a lot of hits on your right. Right. dick, so, you know. Sorry, the confidence. Sorry about the confidence. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just showing Francine here what we, you know, what we get at this program. That you can look and you can see hour by hour how many people are coming to your blog. Oh my God. There are other, and you can see, you know, what are the most recent posts that have gotten hits? How many have they gotten in the last 24 hours? You can really know, in a way, a newspaper editor doesn't know, you know, how many people are reading which articles. A minute ago, a minute ago, a minute ago. What's everybody doing out there? I'm you know, so. linking to my blog. <laughs> So, so you know, it's impossible to avoid this knowledge, and you can tell it's even more cruel in Google Analytics because it shows you how much time the average person spends. Uh, so you can you can really tell like and where what the, what engages them and what doesn't. Now, this strikes me as a power that somehow you have to try to use, because in fact, you know, you you can't sort of to be willfully ignorant with wouldn't do you any good. And, and it's on you to figure out how to build a bridge to the reader for what you care about. And there are different kinds of blogs. There's blogs, Walter's trying to create a blog that is self-sustaining financially and economically, right? And so it has to be, it has to be, it has to be aimed to do that. There are, I, I would say most blogs, and you can correct me if you think I'm wrong, are not. They're, they're, they're people putting out a viewpoint and they're happy to have whatever number of people come to view them. On but even places. they would, generally speaking, rather have more than less. Yes, no, there's there's no doubt that, that we all want more than less. 
Um, do you look at the numbers? Do you get the numbers from your blog post? Is it a different experience from you having written a blog versus written for the other She will now. Walter's going to show me how to do that. Um, no, I don't. I look at the comments, but it's so depressing yep. that I always tell myself I don't do it anymore, and then, I, then I'm drawn to do it again, yeah, we, even though I know it's upsetting. We should talk about more about comments, which we were talking about before. Um, why? Why? Talking about the because, 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 I, because I tell my, let me say, I tell myself that a, that a very particular portion of the population is writing these comments. So it's not so, and in fact, the nice thing is I often get emails from people I know, from other writers, people I respect, responding to the piece, and that's very satisfying and, and gratifying. But these comments who are, you know, I mean, just for example, uh, the cell phone piece. There were several comments that said, like, oh, if they're so poor, why do they need cell phones? You know, it was the opposite of what it intended. And, and, and you know, there's a weird thing, is, which is that you don't, when you, you're suddenly aware that there are people out there thinking about you, which is not necessarily a good thing. I mean, or the way they're thinking about you is not necessarily a good thing. And, that, and that's very, that can be very disturbing. Or if you think that you've spent or you have, think nothing, if you've spent a great deal of time, because as I say, these pieces take three days, four days, constructing an argument, a very careful argument. And then it's clear that a number of readers, they, it's not that they can't follow an argument, but they're so, they're like, they can all, certain words just set them off. So the argument is beside the point. They're set off by that one word, and then they just go off, so to speak. Then, then you think, oh, all this time I spent constructing an argument, I hope this isn't the only person out there that could not. So, so that's what I mean by constructing an argument. Jake? Uh, I was just wondering, as three professional bloggers, how you go about finding blogs that, that interest you. Because if I were to look out there, and I just wouldn't even really know where to begin. And so I'm wondering how you find them. Do you read blogs, Francine? Now I read you're a blogger? I read some. I'm very bad at it. I don't know how to find them. I'm, I'm eager to hear the two of you tell me because I, I don't know. Well, once you read one and you find one you like, it's a custom to have what's called a blog roll, usually on the right side, sometimes I guess on the left side. And if you find one blog you like, um, you can often go and look at their blog roll. Uh, and sort of see some of the blogs they read, um, and uh, and and you'll you'll often uh, get a sense of, of things that are out there. The danger in that often is that you'll read things that are all from one perspective, um, and so it is important to, to, to try and find things that, that don't always take the same the same approach. But uh, you know, and if you again, if you find one, they'll often cite other blogs, and, and you'll start to see. Right? See where other blogs are, but it is a it is a hard. I mean, one of the one of the situations we're now in is it, it used to be that generally, if something was important, it would end up in the New York Times or some other legitimate paper like that, and that's just not the case anymore. You don't know any given day where the important commentary on a particular issue or a particular theme is going to show up, and it 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 means that you know you have to sort of look. Now there are people who help you. You know, um, there are people who use Twitter and Facebook and blogs, and what they do is they go out and they read 20 or 30 things, and you start to trust a couple of these people who, um, on their in their blogs or on their Twitter feeds, I, mean, I, I I refuse to do the Twitter feed thing. I know Walter finds it very useful, um, but it's just read up a storm. No, but you, know, you read it. I mean, you get a lot of. You, there are people out there who are constantly tweeting the articles that they're reading. Um, but but you know one of the things we just started this this month at the RN Center is we have a, a now a weekly newsletter that comes out Sunday morning um, called Amor Mundi, the Love of the World, in which we recommend five or six articles that have come out in the last week um, that we think are important and that you should read. And uh, it's just one other way of trying to help people with exactly the the issue you're, you're talking about. Um, so, but it's it is a problem, and I think a lot of people feel overwhelmed by it. But, well, I don't know if you have a... well, I you know one thing, uh, many people these days who you don't think of as bloggers, like Francine, do in fact have blogs. 
So when, some, when I find that, you know, even if it's an article somewhere or a book, and I'm interested, and I think, you know, this, this person is really interesting, Google them and see if they have a blog. They very often do. Sometimes it's simply a blog where they, they'll basically throw a lot of their other links to whatever articles or whatever they've got going. But that's also great. If you want to know what so-and-so says on everything, this is the way to do it. Um, and I do like Twitter as a way of finding out about new people or new, new things. Uh, you know, we, we sort of laugh at Twitter. But in fact, in its Chinese form, Weibo, Twitter is probably, you know, Weibo is also a microblog, which means 140 character maximum for every post. Although the characters are full words. Well, that's it. Well, in Chinese, you can say a lot more with 140 characters than you can in English. But it's also, it's, a, it's in modern Chinese history, it's the first form of mass communication that is grassroots to grassroots rather than, than top down. So it's quite revolutionary. And a lot of what's going on in the environment and so on in China is very much directed toward Weibo. During the Arab Spring, Twitter was a, a major force um, in that, uh, the, the, and you could get it in the US, a guy named Blake Hounsell, who was an editor of Foreign Policy, uh, made it his business during the Arab Spring to monitor tweets from everybody he could find out who was involved in this in some way. So it very often meant that you would know what was happening in Tahrir Square or in Tunisia or something before the newswire services picked it up. Because and, and with this incredible vividness, because these people are just tweeting in their impressions of what's happening now. Is it accurate? Is it not? all up in the air, but it's a new way to relate to what's going on. So one of the things you do is you look for somebody who keeps bringing you new and interesting content, and when you find it, you look on them. I mean, one of the, I just quickly, one of the problems that one has with this is you get overloaded. I mean, I don't know how much, I mean, if you really want to do, lead certain bloggers and participate in the blogosphere conversations, you quickly realize that you're you have to read things all day, and there's very little time to think for yourself. Sometimes. That is that's a problem, and, and you'll sometimes see a lot on Twitter people saying my Twitter addiction has overcome me. And people talk about going on a Twitter a tweet fast. <laughs> but I mean, this is a problem with blogging. It, 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 you you end up repeating things that people say as opposed to thinking and reflecting and standing that back. That part is probably better being, you know, having been around for a while. You've sort of, right. you've accumulated a little more intellectual capital. And that, I think that is, that's a trap that younger people can fall into on the internet, is to be so consumed in the, in the back and forth and, and the now that you never really, you, know, you never really read all those books and have all those experiences and think all those thoughts that 10 or 15 years from now will equip you to be one of the people who's shaping the conversation rather than somebody who's sort of passively receiving. Uh, Sainte? Um, this question is sort of tangential to yours. Uh, if you talk about the benefits of being a blogger and the idea of you know a personal form, more personal form of writing, and uh, I was wondering if you could talk more about the perspective of the reader. What is the benefit of somebody who's reading blogs? I mean, why is this form of writing so beneficial for the people that are reading them? And uh, what are the pitfalls of that as well? I mean, if we're talking about and if we're characterizing blogging as something instantaneous, then what's the benefit of reading something you know, of a thought which just came up? But that hasn't been edited, that hasn't been processed. I mean, I, just you know, the perspective of blogging and its benefits or pitfalls as a reader rather than a writer. Well, the first thing I guess I'd ask is what are the alternatives? I mean, what's out there to read now? I mean, that you know, there's so many problems with our so-called major newspapers. So, so that's one. Or, um, or magazines. You know, there's so few magazines. I mean, it's you know, it, it's all, it's all kind of glommed together in a certain way. I mean, I don't. You might as well read really good blogs that you like as opposed to, say, the five magazines that exist anymore, or three, or two. New so, York Review of Books. The New York Review of Books, accepted, yeah. accepted. And Harper's maybe, sometimes. Uh, and that's it. 
And that's it. So what? So you might as well find blogs that you like and trust, because because there are very few reading options. Yeah, I mean, you know, just to take the Han Arendt perspective, you know, Han Arendt. Most people writing about Han Arendt write long thirty-page articles in academic journals with lots of footnotes. Uh, she was. You know, she's she's someone who's brought up every once once a year in the New York Review of Books and the New Yorker, usually because she was married, you know, in love with Heidegger or something like that. But even though she was a major public intellectual, she wasn't someone that was part of a wide political discourse. Now, like Francine, sometimes like you know, we hope that she's going to become like that, then everyone's going to be talking about the Han Arendt view on this or the Han Arendt view on that. But that's not really the goal. But the fact that now, you know. 5,000 people a week are reading um, the Han Arendt Center blog and listening to what scholars of Arendt are saying about her work and it's, it's, it's much more accessible. So from a reader perspective, you get, you get pieces, essays, little essays that are edited and written with a public in mind around political issues or cultural issues. And, um, and, 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 and so it becomes something you can do while you're procrastinating or in your free time. And you can share it on Facebook and you become part of a community. And I think a lot of people read it as part of a community, as, you know, uh, in that way. The, yeah. Well, I, I think it's also that your traditional newspaper or your magazine is a little bit like, you know, J.C. Penney's or Sears or Macy's, you know, a department store that doesn't get anybody exactly right. But offers, you know, sort of generally reasonable, acceptable merchandise, and a, and blogs can be, you know, these wonderful little stores that you know hit, you know, go much deep. You know, if you're interested in blue jeans, go to the blue jeans specialist store rather than to Sears. And this, you know, you think about, I, I think law blogs and economics blogs are two really great places where, as a result of blocking. There is much more intelligent commentary on events. You know, you could, I mean, professional economists have always and will always write long theoretical articles or even long retrospective, but to have a serious, intellectually serious economist writing about what he thinks about the president's tax reform proposal or the Federal Reserve Board's latest interest rate decision in real time. And in a forum where he knows other professional economists are going to read him, as well as the public, so that he's not just sloughing off with his second-rate thought, because he actually knows his peers are going to be reading this, and if it's bad, they're going to come at it. So you're actually, you as a general reader, have access to more really smart, on-the-moment kind of commentary than you ever had. And much as we all admire the Salzberger family and the editorial board of the New York Times, who are they to tell us every morning which five people have written something that the rest of us should all be reading or talking about? I mean, why delegate that aspect of your reading and becoming an informed citizen to a bunch of people who, you know, what have they earned to, what have they done to earn that? And, and mistakes have been made. <laughs> <laughs> they have been made. It is, you know, and, and sometimes once made, they don't get corrected for years and years. Yeah. So this, as a reader, I find that, blog, that the blogosphere is giving me more choice over the content that I spend my time with, and it is giving me, on average, better quality than what I was getting before from these kind of manufactured, mass market, morning publications. Christiana? No, I had to come in first. Oh. Isabel? Uh, yeah, I'm curious about this idea of the reader, because um, from another question about this question, you know, how do you find a blog? But as a blogger, how do you conceive of your reader? Because it, when you're writing for a magazine, you're writing on assignment, an article, you're very much writing for a particular style, for a particular publication. And um, Walter, I know from Via Media, you have a particular style, and you listen very much to the analytics. But it seems to me that Google Analytics and who is reading your blog kind of obscures, in a sense, who <coughs> these guys are. Who, who are you trying to reach, and what kind of reader you are trying to reach. So 
I guess, in writing your blogs, how do you address this problem of considering what readers you want to reach, what do you want to say to them, and not simply how many of the analytics software would lead you to? Well, I don't mean to sound like a complete narcissist. But I don't think <laughs> that's a great <laughs> sentence. <laughs> that's a great but. <laughs> but I don't think about it. I really don't think about it. I think I mean it's not that I, you know, and it's, I mean in a way I do. But 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 what I'm thinking about is how do I write this as well as I can, and how do I make it as interesting as I can. So I guess both those questions presuppose a reader to whom I'm for whom I'm writing. But I never think you know. Will this person get it? Will that person like it? Will the other person think about it? I don't, because that's, to me, the quickest way to stop yourself from writing anything. Because it, you're suddenly hearing all these voices saying, I don't like this, I'm not interested in that, 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 You know, basically you're writing to a certain extent for yourself. And then saying, what, how can I do this the best way I possibly can? How can I make this as you know, clarity, as you know, for me in my class, is like a god to me. How can I make this as clear as I possibly can? And then, and then the other, the reader will, will come around to that. Yeah, I mean, we, I, on our blog, we, we, we look at the numbers more, more like as a fascination that you sort of like, on the stock ticker, is it going up or down? <laughs> um, but we don't, we haven't done any kind of analysis. We don't, we're not in that, we're not in that business. We're, we're in the business of, trying to put out interesting, compelling uh, essays about Hannah Arendt and the way she impacts the way we think about the world today. And we do think of it as what, you know, in a sense, what might an educated citizen, you know, want to know about this. Um, that said, I, you know, we, we do uh, put a lot of images on the blog uh, and we use them because we know that people respond to that. and. Um, but that's not changing what we write, but we do try to make the blog look as good as we can. Um, and, you know, there are one or two areas that we know that whenever we write about them, they go viral. And so, you know, you don't want to overdo it, but you do have a tendency, you know, we know that whenever we write about the new Hannah Arendt movie, it's going to be read by 15,000, 20,000 people. That's amazing for the blog. And it brings a lot of people to the blog. So, um, you know, we do use that. Well, we, we think a lot about our audience because say our you know our goal legally our goal has to be trying to make a profit because we're a for-profit company and a corporation. Um, I doesn't say that we've actually made a profit, but we're we're trying. Um, every now and then somebody says you profit company and I've made a profit in all these years. I say commercial aviation since the Wright brothers on balance has not made a profit, so we're not that bad. But anyway, we do think, okay, how do we, and it says, how do we build sustainable communities around the kinds of things that interest us on the block? So one of the things that we have, we have been thinking about a lot, and this comes out of the kind of one of the original interests that led me to the block, is that, I mean, I hate to say this, but it seems to me the environmental community is, let's just say, policy challenged. In that you know, there's a, there's a lot of money that's and, inner, and organizational energy that's gone into the modern environmental movement even before the global warming stuff, but now much more on this basis. And there are a lot of people who really feel that the future of human life is at stake. And you look, but you look at the, the you know, and they have a lot of sympathy and support, but you look at their ability to actually get anything done, and it's pathetic. Um, and it is not getting better. And so as we try, to, we try to think about this, and in one way we've done a lot of negative criticism along the lines of, you know, the Global Carbon Treaty, at least to me, and this may be my totally warped personal perspective, but in terms of an international treaty, it's about as hopeful as the Kellogg-Briand Treaty to end war. It's sort of asking the international treaty system to do something that it's not capable of doing. And we can, you know, that's another conversation. But anyway, we've been thinking, so we've also been thinking, okay, but what positively can we talk about? <clears throat> and the thing that has struck us as, as something that is, is well worth pursuing is the concept of kind of a war on the commute and the promotion of telework, uh, telecommuting, 
uh, as people are now calling it in the community, telework. And that this is something that, you know, I don't think 50 years from now the whole human race will be doing these salmon-like migrations upstream and down every day. And I, I think when you sit down and you think about it, the effect of all of this commuting on the infrastructure, on CO2, on other forms of pollutants, but also on family life and leisure, all kinds of things, it's really terrible. In a sense, it's a sign of the primitivism of the industrial civilization that we live in, which is really only 100, 150 years old, and we're not that good at it yet. And unlike a lot of kind of hair shirt environmentalism, you're not taxing things that people like or telling them not to do things that they want to do. You're actually helping to liberate them from something they don't want to do and help them avoid spending money on their travel and so on that they don't want to spend. Anyway, we think this is, we, we know from our numbers, this is an issue that interests people. Our posts on, on these topics get a lot of readers. We know that it's an issue that, the, that, that in our view, the public doesn't fully understand the transformational importance on a whole range of issues that this change would be. It looks to us as we study the way the economy works and so on, this is an issue that has a future. And so we think as a, as a blog, as a publication, helping this issue reach its future is a way that we can build a community around our blog and around our core, and it teaches people the ways of thinking about the world that we think are important. Right? So we're trying, we see this as an issue, we're, we're trying to identify a series of things like this. Issues that matter to readers, that have serious importance, that reflect our core vision of the world and priorities where we can make a difference by writing about them in an exciting and compelling way. So audience, it's old people, young people, environmentalists, feminists, uh, people who are concerned about retirement age because one of the reasons a lot of people have to stop working is not so they can't, not that they can't do the work or don't want to do the work, but that the physical commute is so taxing in various ways, etc. So a lot of people, so we try to organize by interests more than by individuals. And that's that's something that most blogs do and we do as well. There are certain issues that we follow. We got originally followed the, the question of technology and how it's changing humanity very closely for the first couple of years of the blog, and that's something that Hunter Rent wrote a lot about. And Occupy Wall Street was something we followed a lot, but also the humanities and the challenges of teaching and thinking about the humanities and the importance of the humanities today is something we write a lot about. And so you, by writing things about what you're interested in in a narcissistic way, uh, and in, in, a, in an Arendtian sense, as an isolationist person, you put it out there and you see who's going to come. Um, I know, Pat, you had a point, a question? Oh, okay. Oh, you, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to say that it seems that an excellent thing to have on the, on the internet then would be a daily index of blogs. <laughs> and the, the blogger would uh, write in, say, before midnight, every, every evening, and then the, uh, the index would say, uh, Francine Prose writes about cell phones in public schools, or something, you know, something like that. And that would be all, and give a link. Mm -hmm. And that, that would be a very long index, but that way... There, are, there all, are many of those. There, there are many there aggregator was, sites. They're, they're called they're aggregators. <laughs> yeah, but there, there, I, mean, I don't know how many blogs there right. are. The closest one to, to a main one in this is probably something called Real Clear. Their most famous one is Real Clear Politics, which every morning has and then again, they updated in the afternoon what they see as the main political topics of interest um, in America. But they have real clear world. Real, I think they've got real clear sports now. Real clear religion. Real clear markets. So you know that's a place that a lot of people go. 
And it's certainly a place that, that's where a lot of people find my blog, is if one of my articles gets linked there, they come to me. You communicate with them. I don't. <laughs> you know, I wish I knew the way. They, they well, they follow me, right. But, yeah. It would be better to announce it to them. But, then, but you see, unless they've read it, they won't know whether or not they're interested. Walter Mead on the great Egyptian locust play, all right, maybe that's interesting and maybe it isn't. I want to see, they would say I, they want to see it. Yeah, but I don't want to go by interest groups. I would like to go. You want the whole yeah. thing. You just want the whole thing. <laughs> I, I don't know how you're doing, but it would be an interesting sight. Otherwise, you're always, you know, preaching to the choir, you know, yeah. Being, yeah. You know Well, that's an issue. Hearing yeah. the preachers preach to you. Especially when it comes to locusts. Well, preaching to the choir is an interesting topic, actually. Yeah. You want to say something? I don't know what Please. to say about it. I don't know what to say. I mean, I just feel that, you know, when I was, I was writing a lot for Harper's magazine, which I like, but Harper's has a circulation of 250,000 maximum. And that, you know, I just realized, you know, and it was complete pushing to the choir. I don't think there was one person subscribing to Harper's that didn't believe what I believed. So it became sort of demoralizing after a while. And I thought, well, you know. So I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that is. I don't know. There was a question here. A quick statement and then maybe a comment going off of that. In, I'm concerned about the, to my friend here who talked about the New York Times line. I know two of the editors for that. So it's, I'm concerned about the feedback loop and the Logoria. But I also know they read everything that is submitted. So there are opportunities for pluralism to comment. And things clearly like, there's nothing about the Gazette. Yeah, well, I mean, there, there is a way, you know, at least now, it gets co-opted and then it becomes more like an op-ed piece where only the five get. So there is, I think, maybe, uh, you know, a lining around that. But to turn to our rent, and a question about comments and the dynamism of the way you write. Arendt was very insistent upon the, the, pol the relationship between the polis and the orphans, the public and the private. And a lot of times with my friends, I would talk about things, work it out in the private sphere, and then kind of put it out there. Whereas now, you put it out there, and then you're kind of doing it in terms of comments, I mean, the comment thread. So you said you kind of lament and the comments, but is there a way that you engage with those comments and that you see, you know, it changes uh, the way you think about the topic? Do you go back and edit? Are you allowed to edit? Does that, because then you have, in a way, you see the process of thought going on. Whereas to think for a right means to think slow and think in private first. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, is the blogosphere of polis? And to, to more the renting scholars, what would a rent say about the polis of the blogosphere? Yeah. Well, it's an interesting. I mean, it's it's an interesting in many ways because because the factor in all of it is is time. I mean, one of the things about blogging is it's so instantaneous, so that you do put it out there, often without, not without thinking, but but it's easier to do something without long reflection, obviously. But but I've also had the experience of writing something, speaking of Harper's, for a magazine, and then two years later having. And because of interacting with the world through the article, you know, and getting, and it wasn't about, it wasn't about comments on, online, it was about talking to people about, where I wound up having tremendous regrets about things that I'd written. So it can happen, you know, it doesn't necessarily have, it happens less, I think, with, with for whatever reason, people were responding, but it does happen. So it, and it is the kind of thing that makes you think, really? I should wait 10 years before I publish anything so I have more time to think about it. On the other hand, if I had waited 10 years, I might have written the same thing and not gotten the feedback from people that would have made me realize that I had made some mistakes. So, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I guess, um, you know, we actually, we, we started with comments on the blog uh, and we ended up turning them off <coughs> because we were basically spending so much time sort of keeping the crazies and the racists <coughs> and the trolls, I mean, who, you know, who really become fixated, especially, you know, once they get the impression a lot of people read it, it becomes sort of a cause to them uh, to try to get their warped perspective out. And we're going to go back to comments, I think, but we're going to, we've been looking into different kinds of software that would, you know, if it, how much of your how much of your time can you spend on editing comments versus 
you know, actually generating new material or having new ideas or thinking. And what we're going to try to do too is that now the blog is turning into a bit more of a publication with there, you know, we have people covering different issue areas. And so try to have these people, most of whom are much younger than I am, interacting directly with the readers. We may even, we're thinking of trying things like office hours where, you know, for a certain period on some afternoon, one of the kids will be there sort of an ask me anything kind of forum where readers can, who want to respond, you know, to our coverage of the environment or telecommuting or whatever it might be, can sort of hone in on it. And then, you know, the, 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 the writer can then come to me afterwards and say, you know, they really want to know what you think about this and I didn't know how to tell them, uh, what to tell them. So I think we're going we're gonna to look for ways to make that interactivity part of the way, because I think relating to the audience more closely is important. However, we're trying to do it in ways that don't interfere with our internal ability to think and reflect and produce what's important. So I think it's going to be, a, you know, and this is going to be a trial and error process. But I think publications are going to survive because they have people who are passionately invested in them uh, and who want to follow them and who are motivated to act in different ways by the things that they they read and see. And so we need to think about how, how to help that kind of community cluster, form and cluster around the ideas that drive our vision of the world. Yeah, just to, the, the, the institution that for our end that she lamented most that we lost in the United States and that wasn't incorporated in the United States Constitution were the old town councils. The, you know, in New England, the New England Town Council. Um, and Thomas Jefferson, during the constitutional debates, had proposed that there be these kind of town county councils that every, in every area, and they were never incorporated in the Constitution. And from RN's perspective, that was the part that was, that was lost. That's the lost treasure in a certain way. Because there is, for her, what makes us human, in the end, the most human the only thing we actually have a right to as humans for, for Hannah Arendt is to speak and act in public. Um, and to speak and act in a way that means something, that matters. And um, she, much of her writing is about the loss of the meaning of public speaking and public acting. So one way to think about the blogosphere as a polis is to ask the question, and I think it's an open question, of to what extent the, po the blogosphere, the blogging world, is the kind of town council, the, the debating societies that she praised so much in France during the revolution, the council governments in Hungary that she really praised during the Hungarian revolution, the Soviets in Russia during the Soviet revolution. What she loved is when people came together and talked about ideas. But for her, it wasn't just coming together and talking. It had to be in a way that mattered. It had to be about building a new world and building institutions that lasted. And so to the extent that the blogosphere is about people coming together and talking, it is political in our own sense. To the extent it's about yelling at each other and screaming and trolls trolling and, and, and people listening to each other who they agree with but not actually having a meaningful conversation, it's not. And one can say that there's good parts of it and bad parts of it. But it's in process as well and people are still trying to figure it out. Um, but in many ways, it is the new way in which most of, many of us, especially under a certain age, are having our political discussions. And um, from an Arendtian point of view, I think that's very important. We have time for one more question, is there? Um, I'll ask here, sorry. Maybe two, and we'll take to both and we'll answer them. This isn't really a question, it's more, we're so inundated by information, we're just constantly barraged, 24-7. You can't get away from data, from people contacting you, from invading your life. And, you know, as a, a personal level, I did try Twitter very briefly, but I really got the feeling, and this is true of Facebook, as well as, um, I can't remember the third, but that really seemed as if you were doing something. 
thing, but you were actually doing nothing. <laughs> and it was very consuming and addictive, like going to a gambling casino or something. And it was just a complete waste of time. So, listening to you, I hear that there are actually serious people creating serious blogs in which ideas and intellectual dis discourse can take place, where you don't have to turn on, you know, read your blog and have somebody say what a shit you are or, you know, curse you out, um, then that gives me hope. But my own personal response is just too much out there and I've turned off. I've See, turned off. Okay, let's just take Zach's question and then we'll yeah, answer um, both of them. I'm just wondering if you can elaborate a bit more on the problems that you see in the newspaper and magazine world. Um, you touched on the inaccuracies briefly, and you know inaccuracies definitely happen because reporting is difficult and deadlines you know can be really tight. Um, but you must say it's good to offer some kind of diverse perspectives. I mean, through balanced coverage um, in mainstream media, because uh, you know, like you say on the you know similar opinion sharing blogs. Um, these people read are getting like one single perspective, whereas if they read, say, like a standard CNN article, New York Times article, Newsday article, they're getting varying perspectives. I mean, we'll be exposed to the challenging side, one that they don't agree with, but I've always kind of found that to be, you know, something that can educate, something that can push you to think about things differently, and also just exposure that, you know, there are different people out there who have different thoughts. I mean, you know, blogging isn't what I do professionally, I'm a reporter. So I mean, like, I'm very much a product of the newspaper and magazine world. And I mean, like, you know, you don't feel like you're bogging your readers down in just, like, one single perspective? Well, one of the things that I do, that I have done in, in the class I teach at, at BART, is to ask my students to read every week, to pick a story that they're interested in, and to read every week the same story in three different newspapers, and to write about the way language is used in each newspaper to spin, basically, the same story. And, and I don't know, I mean, I, it's always a revelation for me to read their papers, but I think it's also a revelation for them to see that what they've imagined was the gospel because they were getting it from one newspaper actually leaves out certain essential facts or uses language to, to, to shape the discourse in a certain way. So I, I think you're right. I mean, it's great to get all these different perspectives if you read different newspapers. But I think if you read one newspaper, which mo most people I would imagine in this country do all the time, no matter what the newspaper is, if, even the New York Times, no matter what the newspaper, you're not getting a balanced view. You're getting a very particular view. And, um, you know, I mean, I was joking about mistakes were made, but the fact is, real mistakes were made, and, and everything that's come out since the beginning of the Iraq war and so forth has really frightened me about, about the state of, of, uh, of news reporting or newspapers, whatever. I mean, I, I, one of the scariest things I saw was, it was like a Bill Moyer show, and he was interviewing all these reporters about why they didn't ask the next hard question about the weapons of mass destruction. And, and everyone, except for, I think, Mike Ritter, who had no offices in Washington, New York, so no one said, said, you know, they were afraid of losing access, they were afraid of this, they were the editors, da, da, da. all these reasons why they couldn't report what turned out to be the truth about one of the most important things, and, you know, something that obviously we had huge repercussions. So, so that thing, and, and a number of things that happened at the same time, and things that happened to me in terms of sort of little bitty bits of censorship from various newspapers, made me very careful about what I read and what I believe, and, and determined to read several newspapers or several blogs. And, and I'd rather, you know, whatever, however much time it takes, I, mean, I feel quite the opposite in the way that I'm getting information, but I'm not getting too much. I'm in a way not getting enough. And, and I want to make sure that I'm getting as close as I can possibly can to get enough information. One thing, you know, one thing that may be responsive to both comments is um, we're not really trying, I'm not really trying to be somebody's only source of news. Um, you know, that, you know, via media is the only thing you should read today. So I think it's a, it's a different thing right there. But also, um, uh, we try to we try to be a filter, but a but a filter that you know so that people are feeling deluged by what's going on. We you know they know the stories, the main stories that we cover because we're pretty consistent in the 
in the, in the narratives that we're trying to chase. Um, but we try to be very diverse in the sources that we, that we go to for these things. So that you'll find a lot of links on our blog that will take you to newspapers outside the United States or, um, you know, and we try to cover things if we can. One of the big stories that we cover is what we're calling the Game of Thrones in Asia. This emergence of a, of a new international theater of mixed competition, cooperation, it has security dimensions, human rights, all of these things. The advisor, uh, what? It's a basketball player. Uh, Dennis Rodman, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's it's a big story, uh, and so we try to look at you know what people are saying in some of those countries as well as what the and and a, and a story that we covered differently that way because of this was in the U.S. the sort of the, the Myanmar Burma story has really been told as a heartwarming, beautiful morality play of the generals in Burma thanks to the human rights advocacy of NGOs in America, primarily, but maybe a few Burmese as well, have finally seen the light, and as a result, the United States is blessing them and issuing them back into the, into the, into the world. That's, that's basically the story about Burma that most people know. And then now there's the, the stories, like, will they be sincere, or will we have to punish them, and how far will we go, and so on. This, this story. If you pay a lot of attention to what's happening in Asia, it's more China has lost one of its two geopolitical allies. And the moment this began to happen, <coughs> Japan, India, the United States, Australia, Vietnam poured into Burma with all kinds of trade arrangements and, you know, I mean, just this, it's, it's this immense, huge change. Partly, by the way, as a signal to North Korea in some cases of what would happen if it also changed alliance and, and moved toward the West. It's a really interesting story. It has been almost entirely absent from, uh, it's getting a little better now, but for months and years absent in the mainstream press, not out of political bias. You know, no one is really trying to, you know, but, but simply this is the way those events meshed into the kinds of narratives that the people who were writing and consuming the news were interested in. So, I don't know if that's left or right what we were doing, um, but we try, what we try to be is fresh. So, you know, but, but again, we're not trying to replace the New York Times or the Financial Times as, as somebody's news source. We could. And we, you know, we use their work and some, you know, and we, we link and we give credit and all of that stuff. But we think there's something to be gained from a different perspective. Yeah, I'm, I'm driven to make a comment. Uh, and, uh, I don't very want to quick, very this. quickly, Chad. Sure. It just seems to me, and I'm not an expert, that this is so low tech that there's got to be something, some iteration above this that you all can be thinking about that's going to bring it to the next step. Really we'll is directly so beam it into your mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have no choice. By the way, Google, Google Glass is the next step. But we're going to, we're going to, we're going to have to end there because I know we said we'd try and end by 8.30. The next, the next uh, iteration of this, next session is next week, Tuesday, March 12th at 7, 6.30 for cocktails. 7 o'clock we'll start with uh, Dylan Byers and Amy Gates. So thank you all very much. And thank you, Francine Crow. Thank you. Uh, I think I think I think it's a good job. Yeah, I read that well.